الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإن طائفتان من المؤمنين اقتتلوا فأصلحوا بينهما فإن بغت إحداهما على الأخرى فقاتلوا التي تبغي حتى تفيء إلى أمر الله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد It is the eve of the shahada of Amir al-Mu'mineen I expect a lot of salawat from this audience صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Tonight, we gather to commemorate the martyrdom of Sayyidina wa Mawlana, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Where do we begin? Where do we begin the discussion? Do we begin to talk about his knowledge or his righteousness? or his spirituality, or his bravery and courage in the battlefield, where exactly do we begin when we speak about Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam? Tonight we stand in front of a vast ocean, an endless ocean, an ocean of knowledge, an ocean of patience, an ocean of courage, an ocean of bravery. However, my dear brothers and sisters, tonight I'd like to shed light on one of the aspects of the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi so salam so that we may learn and benefit from this occasion. I'd like to shed light on a very important aspect from the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen from the past that is very much related to the present, to the present time. As we all know, after the death of Rasulullah, Amir al-Mu'mineen was marginalized for 25 years. He was kept away from power for 25 years away from the position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen for him. They kept him away from that position and he stayed at home. And after 25 years, when he came to power for five years, when Amir al-Mu'mineen finally reached Khilafah, or rather to say Khilafah finally reached Amir al-Mu'mineen, because he was never in pursuit of the Khilafah and the leadership. And he was never in need of the Khilafah and leadership. The Khilafah was in need of him. When the power reached him, and he ruled for five years, these five years, they were full of civil wars. They were full of battles and civil wars. One of the civil wars that Amir al-Mu'mineen fought was called the Battle of An-Nahrawan. Very important war. Very significant war. This war or battle, so to speak, it was fought against the Khawarij. Against the Khawarij. This name is very important, as we shall see. Amir al-Mu'mineen at the Battle of the Nahrawan, 
he fought against the Khawarij. Now, last year, on June 29th of 2014, in Iraq, a man by the name of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi announced himself to be the Khalifa, the Imam for all Muslims, the leader of ISIS or ISIL. This notorious group that up to the present day they have occupied half of Iraq, half of Syria, they have presence in Yemen, in Egypt, in Libya, in Nigeria, in the Philippines, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan. You see? In Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, this notorious group, this infamous group, this terrorist group, is infiltrating in almost every country. This group, by modern scholars, journalists, researchers, are considered what? Khawarij. You see? The same group that Amir al muminin alayhi salam fought over 14 centuries ago, today, ISIS is considered by many as Khawarij, that same group that Amir al muminin fought and eradicated. Or so we thought that they were eradicated. Tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, in the limited minutes that we have, we'd like to discuss the following. Number one, who are the Khawarij? And where did they come from? Who are they exactly? Number two, what are their qualities and characteristics? Number three, how did Amir al-Mu'mineen salam deal with them? What was his policy towards them? Number four, what do the Khawarij and ISIS have in common? Are ISIS really Khawarij or are they more than that? Number five, what makes ISIS so special? And how do they pose such a great threat? Not just to the people of the Middle East, but people worldwide. Number six, proposed solutions to end the threat of ISIS. And number seven, we will examine how the th how the demise of Amir al muminin was at the hands of the Khawarij. Wa sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. From the days of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, we see that Rasulullah prophesied. He foretold the future. He told us that there will come a group in which their salah is a beautiful salah. In fact, when, when we compare our salah to them, Rasulullah would say, that when you will compare your salah to them, you will say that my salah is nothing. It has no value compared to their salah. Such a beautiful salah with so much concentration. And they recite the Quran very beautifully. However, it doesn't exceed their throats. It only exists here in their throats. That's it. As for implementing the Quran, acting according to the Quran, no. The Quran stated, يَخْرُجُ فِي هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ قَوْمٌ تُحَقِّرُونَ صَلَاتَكُمْ مَعَ صَلَاتِهِمْ يَقْرَؤُونَ الْقُرْآنِ وَلَا يُجَاوِزْ حُلُوقِهِمْ or وَلَا يُجَاوِزْ حُلُوقَهُمْ يَمْرَقُونَ مِنَ الدِّينِ مُرُوقَ السَّهْمِ مِنَ الْرَمْيَةِ When you compare your salah to their salah, you will say that my salah is nothing. Their salah is greater. However, 
and they recite Quran very beautifully. However, it's only about recitation. There's no implementation of the Quran. There's no practice of the Quran. They will, they will deviate from the Quran the way that an arrow deviates from its objective, from its goal. These were the Khawarij. Rasulullah foretold about the Khawarij. He told us about what will happen, who are the people that will come, and what exactly they will do. What is the origin of the Khawarij? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. When Amir al Mu'mineen Ali Salam came to power, he fought three battles. Three battles. One was the Battle of Safin against Muawiyah. Well, before that, the Battle of Jamal, the Battle of the Camel, and the leader of that battle against Amir al Mu'mineen was none other than the wife of Rasulullah, Aisha. And the two companions of Rasulullah, Talha and Zubayr, they led, they led a battle against the Imam of their time. This was one. The second battle was the Battle of Safin under the command of Muawiyah. And the third was the Battle of Nahrawan led by the Khawarij. At the Battle of Safin led by Muawiyah, now, there's something that we have to understand about Muawiyah. Muawiyah was a con artist. Muawiyah was deceitful. Muawiyah was an expert in fooling the people. Amir al-Mu'mineen has a saying. He said, if I wanted to be like Muawiyah, then I would have a lot more followers than Muawiyah. But the difference is Muawiyah fools and he's deceitful and he lies. He's a con artist. Yeah, me, I, I speak the truth. I don't fool anyone. I'm not deceitful for anyone. That is why Muawiyah has more followers than I do. And I have less followers than he does. During the Battle of Safin, and this is very important to understand how the Khawarij came into being. At the Battle of Safin, Amir al muminin was winning. He was ahead. He was winning the battle. They reached a point in which Muawiyah's army was not only being defeated, Muawiyah's empire and rule was under threat. He was about to lose the battle. Here, Muawiyah had a advisor by the name of Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As, Muawiyah was a carn artist. And he was deceitful. Amr ibn al-As was even worse. He was even worse. Muawiyah told Amr that we're, we're about to lose the battle. And Ali ibn Abi Talib is about to defeat us and win. Think of something. You have to think, think of something. Otherwise, we will lose. Amr told him, I have an idea. Let's have our soldiers left, lift copies of the Quran on their spears, on their spears, and let them shout that let the Quran be the judge, let the Quran be the arbitrator between us. Let the Quran tell us who is right and who is wrong. Indeed, the army of Muawiyah, they grabbed their spears, they poked copies of the Quran on their spears, and they lifted those spears in the middle of the battle. The soldiers of Imam Ali, they saw a peculiar sight. The enemy army, they're not fighting. Instead, on their spears, they're carrying copies of the Quran and asking the army of Imam Ali to let the Quran be the judge. Not Ali, not Muawiyah, but rather the Quran. The army of Imam Ali, some of them, they said, Khalas, we're not going to fight. They came to Imam Ali. They said, let's end the fight. Imam Ali told them, this is a trap. This is a trap. Let's continue fighting. We're, we are about to win this battle against Muawiyah. They said, no. 
How can we fight them when they are raising the Qur'an on spears? Do you want us to fight the Qur'an? Never. End this battle. Imam Ali said, don't be idiots. Don't be fools. Muawiyah is fooling you. Do you think that Muawiyah knows anything about the Qur'an or loves the Qur'an or has any respect for the Qur'an? No. This is only a game. This is a trap. He's trying to trap us and to get you to stop fighting so that he wins. He told us, they told him, you know what, we don't care what you have to say. The battle is over. Tell the commander in chief of your army or the defense minister of your army, Malik al Ashtar, to pull back. Otherwise, we'll kill you. Imagine. Imagine Imam Ali, his own army, his own troops, they're threatening him with death. They're telling him, if you don't pull back, we will kill you. Do you see why we say Imam Ali was mazloom? He was oppressed. He was oppressed by his own followers and his own army and his own troops before the others. His own people, they backstabbed him. Indeed, Amir al-Mu'min was oppressed. Amir al-Mu'min says, Khalas, we'll stop. You want us to stop? We'll stop. He called Malik al-Ashtar. Malik al-Ashtar was advancing. He was about to enter Sham and defeat Muawiyah in his own territory. He had to pull back. The war ended. He came back. Now that they lifted the swords, they said, let's have an arbitration. Tahkim. What does an arbitration mean? It means that they choose someone from Muawiyah's side and someone from Imam Ali's side. They have a meeting, they get together, they have a meeting and they try to find a solution. They're trying to find a solution. Muawiyah, he obviously chose whom? His best advisor, who was a bigger con artist than himself. Who was that? Amr ibn al-As. As for the army of Imam Ali, these ignorant soldiers that told Imam Ali to pull back and not to fight, they told him, let's choose Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was not only ignorant, was not only, so to speak, an idiot, he loathed Amir al mumini He hated Imam Ali He didn't have any sort of love for Imam Ali. The army of Imam Ali said, let's choose Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Imam Ali told him, don't choose this guy. There's so many others. There's so many others. Don't choose Abu Musa. They said, we insist on Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. You see, this is a problem. When an Imam, an infallible Imam, his followers don't listen to him. His followers don't listen to him. Today in Iraq, there's a lot of people that say, why doesn't the marja do this and do that and take leadership? Why doesn't the marja in Iraq take leadership in the Islamic ummah and especially in Iraq? Why doesn't he lead? You know why? When people didn't listen to Imam Ali, an infallible Imam, you want them to listen to a marja? When people don't listen to their Imam, infallible Imam, Imam Ali. Does it get better than that? Yet they didn't listen to him. They tell him what to do. They don't take orders from him. You expect people to listen to a marja? Isn't this one of our problems today? I'm not, and I'm not speaking about people from outside of our school of thought. It's us, our own people. Do you think they listen to our scholars and our maraja? Imam Ali told them, don't choose Abu Musa. They chose Abu Musa. They gather. Amr ibn al-As, the carn artist, the deceitful man, with Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Before going into the meeting, Imam Ali called Abu Musa. Told him, come here. When you go into the meeting, when you leave, when you finish the meeting, when you're about to have a press conference, so to speak, do not be the first to speak. Be the last. Be the last. First, see what Amr has to say, and then you speak. 
This is what Imam Ali told him. This is advice. But look at what the idiot did. They go into the meeting. Amr tells Abu Musa that I have an idea. I have an idea. The best solution is to remove both Muawiyah and Ali. That's the best solution. There's a fight between Ali and Muawiyah. So, so the best thing is to remove both Muawiyah and Ali and let the people choose. Abu Musa said that's a good idea. Abu Musa had hatred for Imam Ali, so it didn't matter for him. He said, that's a good idea. Amr, Amr ibn al-As told Abu Musa, he said, you be the first to speak. Go in front of the people and say that I remove, I having the authority to speak on behalf of the army of Ali ibn Abi Talib, I remove Ali ibn Abi Talib the same way that I remove this ring from my finger. When you're done, I will come to speak. Who is this? Amr, Amr ibn al-As. Once you finish, I will come to speak and I will say, I remove whom? Muawiyah. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari will remove Ali ibn Abi Talib. Amr ibn al-As would remove whom? Muawiyah the same way that I remove my ring. And then we will let the, choo and let the people choose a Khalifa, an Imam for themselves. Abu Musa agreed. He came out. Everyone's listening both from the army of Imam Ali and from the army of Muawiyah. Amr stood, he removed his finger, and he said, I remove Ali ibn Abi Talib from power the same way that I remove this, finger, this ring from my finger. He finished. Amr ibn al-As came. He said, O oh people, I install Muawiyah to power the same way I put this ring into my finger. You see? He had promised to say, I shall remove Muawiyah from power. But the Khan artist, this deceitful man, he said, I put Muawiyah into power and declare him as Khalifa the same way that I put this ring into my finger. Muawiyah became the Khalifa. This was the arbitration. This was the tahkim that the soldiers of, Mu the soldiers of Imam Ali wanted. They got fooled. Here, they realized that they've been fooled by Muawiyah. They came to Ali ibn Abi Talib and they said, what do you say? He said, Khalas. What, what do you want me to say? You wanted me to accept this arbitration. Now what do you want from me? They said, let's go fight. Let's go fight Muawiyah. He said, I can't believe you. Yesterday, I wanted to fight Muawiyah. You told me to pull back, otherwise we'll kill you. Now you want me to go fight? No. No. Because we made a peace treaty. Ali ibn Abi Talib gave his word and Ali ibn Abi Talib will not, go, will not go back on his word. No. They said, how can you accept this arbitration? You accept Muawiyah to be your Imam? They said, he told him, you forced me to accept this arbitration. They said, okay. Khalas. From now on, we declare you as a kafir. You are no longer Muslim. Because you accepted this arbitration, you are no longer a Muslim. And as for Muawiyah, he's, he's not a Muslim as well. You are both kafir. And they split. They split from the army of Imam Ali salam, And they formed their own group, their own political group, and their own military group. They formed an opposition and after several years, they fought Imam Ali at the Battle of the Nahrawan in the city of Basra, the southern city of Basra. And there, Imam Ali fought them, even though he did not want to fight them. But they raised arms against him. And before the battle, and we shall talk about, in a couple of minutes, we'll talk about the details, some of the details of the battle. Thus, the Khawarij was a group, was an opposition group, at the time of Imam Ali السلام, they declared him as a kafir and they declared Muawiyah as a kafir. They formed an opposition group and later they fought Imam Ali. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This was their history and their background and their origin. What were their qualities? Among the qualities of Khawarij was that number one, they were extremely religious. 
They were very religious. When it comes to salah, no one would beat them with their salah. Their salah was beautiful, it was long, beautiful recitation, long sujood, long recitation. They would fast during the day, they would pray during the night. They were extremely religious, extremely pious. Amir al muminin sent his cousin Ibn Abbas to go and negotiate with them. When Ibn Abbas came back, Imam Ali السلام, told him, describe for me the khawarij. What did you see from them? He said, رَأَيْتُ مِنْهُمْ جِبَاهًا قُرْحَ بِطُولِ السُّجُودِ He said, I saw their foreheads, there's black marks on their foreheads. From what? From sujood. Those that you see, there's marks on their foreheads, black marks. That means they prolong their sujood. He said, I saw foreheads with black marks on them. الْإِبِلِ And I saw their skin peeling from their hands. Why? From sujood again, from praying. Because they would, they would put their hands on the ground for a long time. The skin on their hands and arms would peel off. These people were religious. They were Puritans. They were extremely pious. However, their second quality is that they were ignorant. Is that they were ignorant. They were not educated. They didn't understand anything from faith. A lot of prayers, a lot of worship, but it was meaningless. It was nonsense. It was out of ignorance. What do you expect from a group of people that disobeyed the Imam of their time? Not only that, they threatened to kill the Imam of their time and they called him a kafir. They called him a mushrik. This was pure ignorance. They understood nothing of Islam. In Islam, we follow our Imam. The Imam, the Rasulullah, put in power for 23 years, the Prophet kept on repeating the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Yet these people now were disobedient to their Imam and they called him a kafir. Number three, among their qualities was takfir. Was takfir. What does takfir mean? Labeling everyone as a kafir. Everyone was a kafir for them. Uthman was a kafir. Muawiyah was a kafir, Ali ibn Abi Talib was a kafir. In fact, anyone who disagreed with them was a kafir. Does that remind you of someone and a special group nowadays? We shall get to that. One of their qualities was takfir. Anyone who disagreed with them was a kafir. In fact, some scholars state that part of their Part of their theology, the theology of the Khawarij, is that anyone who commits a big sin was a kafir. You commit a big sin, you become a kafir. It was that easy for them to label people as kuffar. Among their qualities and characteristics was that they were barbaric. They were extremely violent. Yes, there was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Khabbab or Khubab, they killed him and then they came to his wife. His wife was pregnant. They stabbed her in her stomach and they took out the fetus and they killed the fetus. And they kept the, and they kept the mother alive. This was one of the actions of the Khawarij. Imam Ali السلام, sent them a messenger by the name of Al-Harith Ibn Murrah al ubaydi They killed him, they slaughtered him, they beheaded him. Thus they were barbaric. They were aggressive, they were violent. And number five, they were an organized group. Extremely organized. Politically, militarily. They formed an opposition. They had a leadership, a hierarchy. It was an organized group. Now, what was Imam Ali's policy? This all occurred during the lifetime of Imam Ali. 
Imam Ali was in power. He was the Khalifa. He was the Imam of the time. How did he deal with them? Number one, Imam Ali السلام, was asked, what do you think of the Khawarij? Are they kuffar? Are they disbelievers? He said, no. Ahum kuffar? He said, no. Hum min al-kufri farru. They ran away from kufr and disbelief. They asked him, are they hypocrites? Ahum munafiqoon? He said, no. They, that, they said, then ya amir al -Mumnin. what are they? What would you classify these khawarij? How would you classify them? He said one sentence. Look at this, the power of this sentence. He said, two words. That's it, just two words. He said, ikhwanuna baghaw alayna. Three words. Ikhwanuna baghaw alayna. They are our brothers, yet they turn against us. Our brothers who turn against us. Amir al muminin did not say they're kuffar, they're disbelievers. Even though they themselves, they called Imam Ali as a kafir. They called him a kafir. They thought that Imam Ali was a disbeliever. Yet did Amir al muminin return the favor and say that they are disbelievers, they're hypocrites, they're agents? No. He said they are our brothers that have turned against us. One of Imam Ali's policies towards the Khawarij was that he gave them freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. They could speak freely. They would hold riots outside of his mosque in Kufa. Imam Ali السلام, during Friday prayer, he would, he would lead the salah. Yet the Khawarij, they would stand outside of the mosque, rallying, protesting, rioting, while the Imam is speaking. Who would give them this, this sort of freedom? Do you think this sort of freedom would exist under the leadership of others before Imam Ali? Or even after Imam Ali? Do you think that would exist? Today, in most of our Islamic countries, go to the Gulf countries, try to protest outside one of the mosques on Friday. See what happens to you. Make sure you, you write your will before you go and you protest. Do you think they'll let you protest? Do you think there's such a thing called freedom of speech in our countries and most of our countries today? Especially the dictatorships and the monarchies and the kings and emperors, especially in the Gulf countries. Where's the freedom of speech? Imam Ali gave them the freedom of speech. They accused him of kuf. They would rally against him. He would say, that's fine. As long as you don't hold a sword against me and fight me, that's fine. Go and say whatever you'd like. One day, Imam Ali السلام, in the middle of his sermon, during the Friday sermon, one of them got up and he started shouting, La hukma illa lillah. There is no rule except for Allah. Al hukmu lillah, la laka ya Ali. Leadership is for Allah, not for you, ya Ali ibn Abi Talib. He kept on. He, he interrupted him several times. Amir al-Mu'mineen did not say, take him to prison. He did not say, off with his head. He did not say, destroy him and his family members, like in some countries. During the days of Saddam, if you were to be in opposition, if you were in an opposition group, not only would you be punished but your own your home uh, your entire family your entire family they would be punished and they would be killed because of one person Imam Ali alayhi salam let him speak not only did he let him speak he said yuradu biha batil. he said yes I accept La hukma illa lillah. only Allah rules but you have a political agenda and then he tells him his rights. He, doesn't, he didn't tell him that if you don't be quiet, I'll put you in jail, I'll imprison your family members, I'll take away your money and land and homes. No, he gives him his rights. He tells him, Lakum alayna thalathu khasad. You have three rights. You are welcome to come and pray at the masajid, at the, at the mosques. Have you seen anyone like this? You oppose him and he gives you your rights. He says, come to our mosques and you are free to pray.
ولا نمنعكم الفيء ما كانت أيديكم في أيدينا and we will give you money as well we will give you from the Islamic treasury we'll give you money ولا نبدأكم للحرب حتى تبدأونا and we will not begin to fight you unless you begin to fight me and us have you seen any anyone with values greater than this someone gets up and opposes him yet he returns by giving him stating to him his rights at another time during salah Amir al-Mu'mineen was interrupted وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مَنْ قَبْلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ He was interrupted in the middle of salah with this verse. Amir al-Mu'mineen continued his salah. He didn't say a word. He allowed them to form a political party. He allowed them to receive from the welfare. Even though they were opposing him, they were in a part of an opposition. He gave them. He did not begin to fight them until they began. And indeed, at the Battle of Nahrawan, when they formed a military, an army to fight him, Amir al-Mu'mineen told him, I will not begin. He told his army, don't fight them unless they begin. When they began, then Amir al-Mu'mineen, out of self-defense, he fought them. And he killed most of them in that battle. And that was the Battle of Nahrawan. This was over 14 centuries ago. Now come with me to 2014 and 2015. Salli Muhammad wa Muhammad. Today, we witness a terrorist, barbaric, violent group called ISIS. On June 29th of 2014, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi announced himself to be the Khalifa and announced the formation of uh, an Islamic state. But if you ask me, I'll tell you it should be called the un-Islamic state, not the Islamic state. Today, half of Iraq belongs to them. Half of Syria belongs to them. They threaten many Islamic countries, their safety and security. Not only that, they threaten many Western countries, European countries, the United States and Canada, Australia and even New Zealand. Many scholars, many journalists, many speakers, many researchers have declared that ISIS are Khawarij. Are Khawarij. Their origin is that same group that Imam Ali salam fought and killed. They say that they are Khawarij. Now, what are some of the characteristics? What are, what are some of the things that ISIS and Khawarij have in common? What do they have in common? Number one, takfir. The same way that, that Khawarij claimed everyone was a kafir, so too are ISIS. Look at the ISIS. Look at their speeches. They declare, they declare everyone as a kafir. Shiites, the Shia are kafar. Christians are kafar. Sufis are kafar. Even some Sunnis are kafar. Even some Sunnis are declared as kafar. And you know what this means? When ISIS declares a group of people as kafar, you know what this means? This means you could kill them. This means they have the right to kill them. This means they have the right to rape their women and take their children as slaves and even their women as slaves. This is what it means. When a group of people, they, they, they call you kuffar, this is very dangerous. This is very dangerous. That means they can take your life and kill you and take your woman and take your children as slaves. This is what it means. This is one. This is one thing that they have in common, ISIS and the Khawarij. Another thing is that they're both barbarians. They're both very barbaric. They're both very violent. We saw in the last year the atrocities that were committed by ISIS. From beheadings, to burnings, to innocent ki killing innocent men, women, and children. 
Thousands of people have been killed so far at the hands of ISIS. In Iraq, some of you are from Iraq. Exactly a year ago, or just a year and a couple of weeks ago, we saw a major atrocity at an airbase called Spiker, correct? When over a thousand and seven hundred young men, over a thousand and seven hundred, over, that's the minimum number, thousand and seven hundred young Iraqi men, they were killed. Many of them are married. Many of them have children. All of them left widows and left orphans. What was their crime? You know what, what their crime was? Their crime was that they are Shia, that they are followers of Ahlul Bayt, they, that they have the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. That is their only crime. They were killed at Spiker Airfield. They kill anyone who disagrees with them. Anyone who tells them that you're wrong will be killed, whether you're Shia or you're Sunni or you're Christian or you're a Coptic. Didn't we see the video of the 20 or more Coptic men in Libya? The Egyptian Coptic men who were beheaded in a monstrous way, in a horrific way, in a barbaric way. Why? Just because they're Coptic. Just because they're Christian, that is their only crime. Right? And how about that poor Jordanian pilot? The way that he was burnt. The way that he was put in a, a cage. And he was burnt to death. I don't know how many of you saw that video or movie. Horrendous. Horrific. When I saw that movie for several nights, I couldn't sleep. Because this wasn't Hollywood. This wasn't an actor. Yes, sometimes we see people burning in Hollywood and movies. This was real life. A 26-year-old young man who has a wife, he has parents, he has a mother, he has a father. Yet they, pour, they poured fuel on him and he was set on fire. He screamed and screamed and screamed until he fell and he turned into ashes. You turned into ashes. And they claim to be Muslim. They claim to be from the nation of Rasulullah. Among the things that they have in common with the Khawarij is lack of knowledge of Islam. What do they know about Islam? Is this what Islam preaches? Islam says that let's spread with the sword by killing, by committing murders and atrocities and massacres. Is this what the Quran preaches? Is this how Rasulullah taught Islam to others? I ask members of ISIS and the young teens and teenagers that are being brainwashed by ISIS, and I'm not just talking about Saudi Arabia or Iraq or the Middle East, no. There's teens that are being brainwashed by ISIS in London and in Paris. And in New York, and in DC, and in Sydney, and all over the world, teens that are being brainwashed. I tell them, look at Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest Islamic country, yes? It's the largest Islamic country. How did Islam reach Indonesia? How? Today they're all Muslim. Most of them are Muslim, not all. There's some Christians. Most of them are Muslim. They pray, they fast, they go to Hajj. They became Muslim because of the sword, because of suicide bombings, because of car bombings. People threatened them, so they became Muslim. Or they became Muslim because of Muslim merchants that went to Indone Indonesia. They did business. The people of Indonesia, they liked the akhlaq and the manners of the Muslims. That is why they became Muslim. How did they become Muslim? Because of the sword? These people are ignorant of Islam. ISIS knows nothing of Islam and knows nothing of the Quran. You know, today someone sent me a post. Someone sent me a post. Someone had posted something on Facebook about ISIS. 
Believe it or not, the person who made the post is Angelina Jolie. Angelina Jolie, and I think it was on, on Facebook. Maybe it was something else, but I believe it was on Facebook. She told a story of a Christian couple that were stopped in Iraq by ISIS. They stopped at a checkpoint by ISIS. They're Christians. ISIS asked them, are you Muslim or are you Christian? The Christian man, he said, I'm Muslim. He lied. He said, I'm Muslim. He said, okay. The ISIS fighters, they told him, if you're a Muslim, read me something from the Quran. This Christian man, he read them something from the Bible. He read them a verse from the Bible. The ISIS man, he said, okay, we'll let you go. They went. The wife started screaming at, the, at her husband, the Christian man. She said, why did you lie? Why did you lie and say that you're a Muslim? And then why did you lie and read a verse from the Bible and not the Quran? Weren't you afraid that they'll kill us? He said, no, because I know, because when I read a verse from the Bible, I know they wouldn't tell it apart because they don't know anything about the Quran. They don't know anything about the Quran. That's why for them it didn't make a difference. Do I read a verse from the Bible or the Quran? Beautiful. And this is true. Do you think ISIS knows anything about the Quran? About the teachings of the Quran? <laughs> and among the things that they have in common with the Khawarij is meaningless worship. Meaningless appearances. When you look at members of ISIS, you see long beards. You see short clothing. You see their women with niqab. They call each other akhi, abu. All appearances. This is all appearances. But where's the Islam? Where's the spirit of Islam? It's just appearance. It's nothing but appearance. Deep down inside, they're devils. And they're serving political agendas. And when we look at the history of ISIS, and especially in Iraq, when we look at the leadership of the Shia in Iraq, we see that the leadership, the Marji'iyya, they followed the footsteps of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. They followed the footsteps of Imam Ali. The same way that Imam Ali alayhi salam said regarding Khawarij, hum ikhwanuna baghaw alayna, that they are our brothers who have turned against us Similarly in Iraq, when the Grand Ayatollah Sayyid al-Sistani was asked about the Sunnis, the Ahl al-Sunnah in Iraq, he said, لا أقولهم إخواننا أقولهم أنفسنا I don't say they are our brothers. I say they are ourselves. They are us. Similarly to Imam Ali alayhi salam. And yes, I don't wish to say that all Sunnis are ISIS or they're sympathetic to ISIS. No. We have a lot of moderate Sunnis that stand against ISIS. In fact, one of the groups that are being oppressed and hurt by ISIS the most are who? Are Sunnis. Musul, they're Sunnis. In Fallujah, in Ambar, in ar raqqa in Deir al-Zur, in other parts in Syria and Iraq, they're Sunnis. And they're living under ISIS rule. They're taking advantage of their women. They're killing their youth. They're taking their wealth. Our Sunni brothers and sisters. Yet unfortunately they have not made their voices heard. Sunnis have to come out and make their verses, voices heard and condemn ISIS. Unfortunately we see that the Sunni institution they're not only not condemning ISIS, they condemn the Shia. The Shaykh of Azhar, Al, Al Azhar, this very well known Sunni institution, the Shaykh of Azhar comes and he condemns the Shia. Instead of condemning ISIS, he comes and condemns the Shia. Isn't this, isn't this a shame? Isn't this a shame? ISIS that's destroying the image of Islam. Anyhow, we see that the grand maraja in Najaf and in Karbala and other places, 
They didn't fight ISIS in the beginning. They didn't raise arms until ISIS raised arms and their threat became imminent to Baghdad, to Karbala, to Najaf. The holy shrines were under threat. It was there that Sayyid Sistani and other scholars, they issued the fatwa for self-defense. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So are ISIS Khawarij? Because we always hear that ISIS are Khawarij. I say that ISIS is Khawarij and more than Khawarij. Not just I say, but this is a prominent belief. ISIS is not just Khawarij, they're Wahhabis. They're Wahhabis and Salafis. And their main mentor is Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah. The scholar that is revered in many parts of the Sunni world. They call him Shaykh al-Islam. He's revered. Thus, ISIS is Wahhabis and Salafis. They're not just Khawarij. Their official religion is the Wahhabi religion or the Wahhabi school of thought. The same radicalism, the same extremism. Their main mentor is Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziyyah Yes. One of the major aspects of ISIS, if you notice, for those of you that have studied ISIS and you look at their movements, you look at the movement, th this movement, you notice a couple of things. Number one, ISIS poses absolutely no threat to Israel. Have you ever heard that ISIS threatened Israel? No, I never heard them. I don't know. I don't know about you. But I never heard that ISIS posed a threat to Israel, that they threatened to occupy Israel or destroy Israel or bomb Israel. No, on the contrary, we heard them make a threat towards Hamas, not Israel. And did you ever hear of Israel or the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, speaking of the threat of ISIS? Did he ever speak of ISIS and that he feels threatened by ISIS? I never heard him. He feels threatened by other Islamic countries, namely Iran, which is the last country to ever attack any country innocently. Because we Muslims, we the followers of Ahl Bayt, we will not attack any country innocently. We will not begin to fight. We will never begin a, an offensive. Yes, we self-defend, but we'll never begin a war. You never see Israel speak regarding ISIS and say that it's a threat. This is one. This is one of the qualities of ISIS. Number two, they work on fear. And this is how they succeeded, my dear friends. And this is very unfortunate. They worked on fear. You know, the city of Mosul, the second largest city in Iraq when it fell to ISIS. Do you know how many ISIS militants occupied the city of Mosul? How many would you assume? 10,000? 20,000 soldiers from ISIS that occupied Mosul? 200. Just 200 soldiers, they came and occupied Mosul. Because they work on fear. Because they put pictures on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram of, of bodies without heads, of massacred women and children, and they spread them all over the internet, people are scared. When they hear that ISIS is coming, obviously you're going to, to flee, and you're gonna run away. Thus they work on fear. Number three, they make use of technology. ISIS makes use of technology. Do you know how many accounts they have on Twitter? Do you know how many social networking accounts they have? How do you think that they're brainwashing people from Europe, from the United Kingdom, from Germany, from France? Do you know how many youth went from Europe to fight in Iraq and Syria along with ISIS because they were brainwashed? How did they do this? By, make, by, by making use of technology by making use of Twitter, 
And why is it that till today Twitter is not stopping these accounts? Doesn't make sense to me. Doesn't it tell you that there's something going on? The same way that Israel does not feel threatened by ISIS, doesn't it tell you that there's something going on? There's a relationship between them? They make use of technology. The movies that they make, ISIS, it's Hollywood movies. Hollywood can't make the movies and the sound effects and the visual aid that ISIS makes. Number four, they are anti-religious heritage. Any religious heritage, religious sites, mosques, graves, they put them on the ground. You know, Muslim has the grave, grave site of Prophet Yunus. There's a mosque and has the grave site of Prophet Yunus. ISIS destroyed that mosque and recently I heard that they wish to make it into a park. The grave of a prophet, they want to make it into a park, an amusement park. Number five, they are anti-cultural heritage. Anything that has to do with culture, with civilization. There's a, an ancient city in Syria called Palmyra. Maybe some of you have heard of it. With ancient ruins. They're putting it to the ground. They're destroying it. They're destroying it. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, we have some proposed solutions, my dear brothers and sisters. Pro proposed solutions to end the threat of ISIS. Number one, the Western world needs to realize that this is not a Shia Sunni war. Whether it's in Iraq or Syria or Kuwait or Yemen or Afghanistan, or, this is not a Sunni Shia war. This is a one sided war from ISIS. It's not a civilian war, it's not a civil war. Because we heard some Western officials, they say, you know what, who cares about Iraq or Syria or Yemen or, or these countries? This is, a civil, this is a civil war between Sunni and Shia. Why should we get involved? And why should we protect the Shia? This is not a civil war. This is not a Sunni Shia war. This is one-sided. ISIS poses a threat not just for the Shia, for Sunnis as well, for Christians as well, for all followers of any religions. Two, we need to make this clear to Western countries that now when you allow your teens and teenagers to come from the UK, from Europe, from France, from Germany, to come and fight in Iraq and Syria, well, guess what? In a couple of months, they're coming back home. They're coming back to London and Paris and Germany and the United States and Canada. And these children, these teens, once they become fundamentalists, once they become extremists, you think they're going to come and sit peacefully at home? You don't think your own countries, these countries, our countries, they're not going to be in danger? Of course they will. That is why you will hear of bombings in Paris and in other countries, in Western countries. Why? Because our countries, these Western countries, we allow these youth to go and fight in Iraq and Europe and, and in Syria, and now they're going to come back and they're going to cause problems. Yes. That's why we say to the West, to Western countries, take this war seriously against ISIS. This world coalition against ISIS for the past several months or the past year, it's a joke. What have they done to stop ISIS? We've seen the more that they bomb ISIS, the more they expand. It's a joke. Take this war seriously. End ISIS before it expands to other countries, to other nations, before they come to your own countries. End them. And them today. Western powers, they have the power to end ISIS within a month. And within a month, it doesn't take a year. And they're fooling us, telling us that they're fighting ISIS. This is a joke. Take it seriously. <laughs> Oh, my God.
we come to Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali, he fell victim at the hands of the Khawarij, the ISIS of his time. Imam Ali alayhi salam was killed by a member of the Khawarij, a man by the name of Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam. He was one of the Khawarij. And he decided to assassinate Amir al Mu'mineen on a night like this, the eve of the 29th. You know why? Because the eve of the 29th, it could possibly be one of the Lalil Qad, one of the nights of power. He wanted to assassinate Amir al Mu'mineen on a night like this so that his action will, will be rewarded, multiplied. The reward will be multiplied. You see how ignorant they are? He came to Kufa and he prepared his poisonous sword. On a night like this, Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he had iftar at the house of his daughter, Umm Kulthum. Umm Kulthum brought him food, two kinds of food bread and yogurt. Amir al Mu'mineen said, Take one of them away. Keep the dry bread and take the yogurt. When have you seen your father eat two kinds of food? I wish to meet my Lord tonight on an empty stomach. I mean, Al Mu'mineen Ali Salam would go outside of the house, he would look at the moon, he would look at the stars, and then he would say, Hiya Wallah, Al Layla, Al Lati Wa'adaniha, Habibi Rasulullah. Tonight is the night that my beloved Rasulullah has told me about, has promised me about. Amir al muminin on a night like this, he spent the night in worship, in prayer, in dua, in salat al-layl, in his famous munajat. The Imam would stand in his mihrab for one last time to speak to his Lord in his famous munajat. مولاي مولاي أنت الخالق وأنا المخلوق وهل يرحم المخلوق إلا الخالق مولاي يا مولاي أنت القوي وأنا الضعيف وهل يرحم الضعيف إلا القوي مولاي يا مولاي On a night like this the Imam spent the night in worship in munajat in dua An hour before Fajr the Imam the Imam headed towards the Masjid Masjid Al-Kufa on a night like this, the Imam did not sleep, not for a single moment. As he was about to leave the house, his belt got stuck in the door. He grabbed the belt, he put it back on. He began to recite, Ashdud Hayazi Makalil Maut. Prepare for death, for death has come near you. Wala tafzaa' min al-maut Iza halla biwadika Kama adhaka kandah Kadaak al-dahru yubkika Imam Ali went to the masjid. He went on the minara. He said the adhan 
the people of Kufa. For one last time, they will hear the adhan of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. This was the last time they will hear the sad voice of Ali ibn Abi Talib saying, Allahu Akbar. Amir al Mu'mineen comes down from the Minar. He comes down to his mosque. He sees Ibn Muljam sleeping in the mosque. He goes to him, Ya Abdullah, get up. It's time for Salah. This is his enemy. He knows that he will assassinate him. Yet he wakes him up. He make he wakes him up for salah. The Imam stands in his mihrab. He says the takbir for the salah. Allahu Akbar. He enters in his salah. He goes for ruku. Subhan Rabbi al Azim wa bihamdi. He goes for sujood. Subhan Rabbi al A'la wa bihamdi. He raises his head from sujood. People hear a shout from behind. Allahu Akbar. The sword comes down on the head of their master. Ain al Munadi wa Imam. Mama, wa Madluma, wa Aliya. He falls in his mihrab. The blood comes out from his head. It fills the mihrab. The first words of Imam Ali were, "Fuzdu wa Rabbi al-Kaaba." By the Lord of the Kaaba, I am victorious. The people of Kufa, they hear shouting, there, there is high winds. The doors of the mosque of Kufa, they close and they open. They hear Jibra'il shouting in the sky, Tahaddamat wallah arkan al-huda. قتل علي المرتضى قتله أشق الأشقياء الحسن والحسين. They rush to the mosque. They see their father in the mihrab. Dear father, who did this to you? Al Hassan comes, sits next to his father. Hussein comes, sits next to his father. Imam Hussein looks at the hand, injured head of his father. My dear brother Hassan, give me a cloth. Let me stop the bleeding of my father. There was only one injury to the head of Imam Ali. Yet so much blood. Imam Hussein could not see that one injury. I say, Aba Abdullah, what about you? What about your body? How many injuries did it have in Karbala? <laughs> Sayyida Zainab comes to her brothers. She wants to see her father. But in which they will she, she see her father. He's lying in his mihrab with blood all around him. <laughs> Assalamu alaik, Sayyidi wa Mawlai. يا أمير المؤمنين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون With the tears that you have in your eyes, raise your hand in dua and tonight could be one of the Liali Al-Qadr Our dua is accepted in this night Tonight is the night of dua بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله اللهم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا همنا إلا فرجته 
ولا عيبا إلا سترته ولا خوفا إلا منته ولا رزقا إلا بسطته ولا شملا إلا جمعته ولا مرضا إلا شفيته ولا غائبا إلا حفظته وأدنيته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة لك فيها رضا ولنا فيها صلاح إلا قضيتها ويسرتها يا أرحم الراحمين ولأرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والعلماء والشهداء نقرأ سورة الفاتحة مع الصلوات الله